everybody, my name's Emma and I look after the ILD in the UK. But I would also massively like to introduce you to Beatrice, who is the ILD UK Regional Coordinator. You're going to give us a little wave. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, so she looks she looks after all us on a, on the kind of day to day basis and has been very uh, key in arranging tonight's uh, uh, presentation. I'd like to thank um, Sean. Give us a little wave, Sean, uh, from Hi. 3LR and also to Kat from uh, ETC for sponsoring tonight's events. Uh, I'd like to say hello to Kevin Theobald, past president of the ILD, and to welcome anybody who's not currently a member of the ILD to join. You can contact me later to find out more about that. And I'm going to very quickly pass over to our um, speaker tonight, which is uh, Dr. Alcasi uh, Saletto to um, talk about the kind of history of uh, theatre lighting and its relationship to architectural lighting. During the conversations, if you want to ask questions, please do so using the chat facility. And if we've got time, we'll answer those questions at the end. If not, just give me a little email and we'll put uh, those questions uh, to her at the end and we'll connect all the dots. So hopefully with this, the shared screen option is working. Over to you, Alcasty, thank you. Emma. Okay. Right. So, um, uh, so this is this lecture is part of uh, the material that we have been where I have been uh, composing for the new module in the Bartlett in UCL, and uh, the common thread of this material is basically looking back at the history and the evolution of lighting design. We are all lighting designers, professionals here, whether younger or older. And I think that the status of the profession has risen dramatically lately, and there isn't so much reference to the identity, how it was built, and why we are what we are. Um, uh, so basically, I uh, collected material that kind of supports a little bit of where we began and how things we use on an everyday basis, where they came from, and what exactly, what kind of problems they answered in the past. And since they're still there, those techniques and those ideas, it means that those problems are still there and we are still resolving them in those techniques. So in this particular subject, it's, uh, it's relating to the theater, the stage lighting. There's a lot of uh, very talented stage lighting designers or lighting designers who have as their past uh, coming from the theater. And uh, there's a very good reason why. So, um, uh, I'm going to share the screen now and I will, uh, I will make a, a, a trip to the past. I have to say that the material is quite dense. Some of you are coming after work, so I understand you must be tired, but um, hopefully uh, the recording means that you can go back to it if you, if, you don't, if you don't think you can focus in all the details and, um, and uh, hopefully you don't fall asleep at some stage. Okay. So, um, so obviously the very, 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 very first theaters were the Greek and the Roman uh, theater. And obviously there wasn't any artificial lighting at that time. Um, and maybe not everybody knows that the orientation of the theater had very much to do with how daylight was uh, casting onto the space. So they were all built in a, in a way so that the, uh, the afternoon shows, which were between 6.30 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. in the summer period, would mean that the light was, that the sun was casting shadow on the auditorium, but it was, um, it was providing light to the proscenium and the, the basically what constitutes the stage. And this beautiful picture here from the uh, theater of uh, Epidaurus or Epidaurus, as we say in, in Greece, shows how the shadow in a, in an afternoon is um, cast is, is cast on the auditorium while the stage is brightly brightly illuminated, and there's a lot of studies basically that done modeling to prove that. Apart from the excellent acoustics to show the the sun path, this one is from a study on the theater of Syracuse that shows how that was done basically in the in the with the sun solstice on the 21st of June. So that was it. Quite limited at the time. And then, and then it was time for the medieval theater, uh, where it was basically religious themes, and they, they were just 
um, making props on public squares and they were playing uh, on the, uh, using daylight and the people would gather on the squares and what's. So there was no technicality and uh, nothing to do about to control the light was just using what was there. Um, so in the UK, the religious theatres were banned at some period, as many of you might know, um, but then they were reintroduced in what is called then the Restoration Theatre. The Restoration Theatre was quite interesting because Inigo Jones was the one who brought the techniques from the Renaissance Italy and brought all the knowledge into the, the English Restoration Theatre and uh, helped produce um, the, the, the legacy and, and all the stage lighting techniques we're gonna we're gonna see it later on. So the Elizabethan theater, which is what you know as the globe, is the, the first version of that, which was again open to daylight, a little bit protected from the weather, uh, but uh, nothing, nothing more than that. And slowly, gradually, the theaters moved indoors. And that's where obviously the, the, the artificial lighting became a necessity. The only thing that was that was available was chandeliers and sconces with many many candles, um, and uh, and we're and uh, we're going to see how uh, from hanging chandeliers uh, the the theater the, the lighting of the theater uh, became a lot more um, sophisticated gradually. So in Italy uh, there was a there was a lot of. Um, cultural uh, revolution happening during the Renaissance and that also swept the theater. So there was a lot of, a lot of money. Italy was quite rich at the time and, and, uh, and the architecture was uh, full of experimentations focusing mainly on perspective. And a lot of famous architects of the time were called in to, to build royal theaters and use their artistry into playing with the perspective, creating new things. Um, and uh, the most famous of that time is the Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza. And it's very, very famous because there's a very clear, uh, intensified uh, use of perspective in the, in the way the stage is made, uh, more like a permanent installation of the stage. Um, but the fact that uh, architects started to become involved into the stage design and creating uh, resolving engineering problems meant that there was a lot of invention and a lot of experimentation happening with everything, with, uh, with the construction, with the costumes, and with the light itself, which was super, super important. Um, the, very, the most famous uh, of the stage lighting designers, uh, or rather stage architects or scene scene designers was uh, Sebasta Sebastiano Serlio, Nicola Sabatini, and um, uh, sorry, I forget the other one, uh, Leone di Sommi, which were all based in Renaissance Italy. And each one of them coins some very important, they wrote treatises about theater. So it is the first time where they start explaining how you do things and how you like things and what you want to achieve. But also a few fragments of, of theory. Um, like why, why do we need moods and how we can create them and what's um, uh, differentiating between the subjects. So Sebastiano Serlio is the one who introduced colored light for the first time. And he did that by taking bottles, uh, which could be uh, rather convex or concave, and they, he would fill them with wine and then put a uh, flame behind that. So that would create uh, either light red or dark red or uh, in his treaties, he also mixes as other colors to achieve what we have here, what we, we achieve today with, um, with gels or with uh, colored LEDs. Um, also the fact that the bottles he was using were convex meant that uh, it was a primitive way of focusing the beam and creating something like a spotlight. That was not a very great invention at the time because it was very it was already known that if you take a bowl and you fill it with water or if you take a glass a solid glass bowl and you put a candle behind it then you get the um you get a, fo a very a focal point and that was for example used by lace makers there was a, a way of um not amplifying but concentrating the light beam in a very very detailed task and if you have an interest about the luminaire design, let's say, of candles, 
you'll find those funny mirrors as well, um, bronze concave mirrors where you have the uh, position of the candles there and they would do something similar. They would um, rather the opposite thing. They would spread the light beam um, and then you would uh, amplify the light uh, onto the face of the person who was, uh, who was um, looking itself in the mirror. Uh, maybe in this case, not so much of a mirror, the picture of that, but it's more like of uh, amplifier for, for the room rather than for the, for the person who sits there. Um, Nicola Sabatini was much more elaborate in the me mechanisms he created. So um, there's some of sketches that are attributed to him, some others he recorded in his treatises. I find very interesting, for example, mechanisms he devised for changing the scenery. So they would be revolving around those um, triangular and they would change uh, or they would slide across. And those were called periacti or peri, probably in English, you try to, I don't know exactly how it's called, but it could be something like periacti, but it's written down here. Um, Another thing he devised is mechanisms for controlling the light. So basically, he uh, he uh, he coined the terms of um, of dimming the lights. Well, it wasn't actually dimming; it would be basic, very very simple placing buckets on top of candles. But the interesting it is it is kind of primitive. But the interesting thing is the very first time where uh, a concept of controlling the light and changing the light is introduced and it's linked to a necessity to a very clear reason which is obviously helping the plot that is on the theater um, and apart from uh, apart from the dimming and from directing the light or the colored light there was also uh, the third, the third contributor, which I, uh, which is Leone Di Sommi, wrote wrote this um, treatise where he talked for the very first time about darkening the auditorium. So up until that time, everything was um, based on a bland ambient light coming from chandeliers, no ability to control it. All you wanted is more of it because we don't realize today how inadequate, how grossly inadequate it was. So the more, the better. Um, and there was no no thought of uh, how long how long do we do we need it everywhere? Do the people need to see each other where they're watching the plot? So it's the very first time where the differentiation of the stage and it's split in two. The auditorium should be dark, and the scene or proscenium should be should be as bright as it gets. Um, so all those concepts that we have today, the dimming, the darkening of the auditorium. The positioning of the lights, it was also covered on the treaties, the flat light, the flood lighting, and the play with some translucent cloths dyed or not dyed to create variations and hues are all those things that um, were basically covered and experimented with in the Italian Renaissance uh, theater. However, as we said, the problems were um, the, the, the only source at the moment was candle or, um, or oil lamps, uh, which meant that there was a lot of problems, apart from the gross inadequacy of that, was that if you wanted to dim the lights, uh, you had a snuff boy. A snuff boy was a, a person who was running around, regardless of what was happening on the stage, and was trying to put, quickly put off the lights. And this is what this lovely uh, engraving I found kind of tries to tries to depict here: the snap point, quickly um, uh, putting off the footlights. Uh, the other problem was that we said, as we said, that the uh, the candle lighting was grossly inadequate, which meant that uh, the people who were drawing the stage lighting had to had to use super saturated colors on the paints because they, they weren't visible. So they had to make it as visible, as, as intense as possible. Equally, the actors and actresses were uh, having a very strong makeup and they were trying to make the gestures as exaggerated as possible. I mean, this picture here is not from the uh, Renaissance, it's from 1920s expressionist uh, cinema, but you get the picture. Um, also, the chandeliers were hanging uh, from the ceiling, trying to illuminate as much as possible. And we all know the inverse square law, the further you got it, the worse it was lighting. So they had to be close to the stage. And the closer they were, the more of the obstacle they were for some of the patrons of the theater. So yes, chandeliers were, they were an obstacle. They were dripping. 
they were dripping hot wax on the people. And obviously, another small problem is that most of the fires, most of the theaters got fire within 25 years of their life. Uh, they tried to invent water, um, um, water basins to kind of uh, save the situation, but it didn't save many European theaters uh, from fire. So, um, so when so when the gas came, uh, that was a that was a revolution. It was so bright; everybody was super happy about it. Apart from the stagecraft people, they weren't happy about it because uh, it, it was so much illuminating. All the paintings started to lose their magic, and they had to subdue the colors to make it not so saturated. And the actors had to lessen their makeup effectively. Um, so um, um, so the theaters rushed to engage into the gaslighting and change uh, the positions of where they had the candles and try to replace them with gas. Um, but also there were some innovations that happened during that time as well. One of them is the, the limelight projector where the expressions in the limelight comes from, which is a uh, a kind of focused projector um, uh, that we, we meet in most in the UK and in, in France it was the um, it was the arc lamp that dominated and created that strong accent, the strong spot effect. Uh, also, the gas had the uh, the benefit of of a valve. So by turning the valve, you could control the flow of gas and then effectively dim the lights. So this this beautiful picture here shows cablings and then shows uh, um, uh, some typical of control panel, not typical uh, equivalent of control panels where um, there, there, were, there would be valves. Sometimes they were in the basement and people were taking orders to, um, to turn the valves and, and, reduce, and reduce the flow of gas. Um, so, uh, the, the focus themas, the, the, the idea of the limelight uh, also created the, um, the, what we call the magic ladder, who was a, basically the very first primitive um, uh, mechanism of the projected image. Um, it, you, you find it in literature as the magic lantern or lanterna magica or um, uh, other similar descriptions. And here is a here is a picture of um, a special effects in theater by means of projected image. So they're creating a ghost on the stage by uh, hiding the, the the person in the kind of basement, um, and then with a um, slightly mirrored um, panel, uh, they created a very blurry uh, but still uh, if visible for the audience figure of uh, of a ghost. Uh, so the gaslighting was a revolution, but it was a revolution that lived very shortly. Uh, it had its problems, and the problems were that it was overheating the theaters, people were, were, were sweating, it was uh, depriving theaters of oxygen, and um, um, so people were feeling very nauseated and dizzy by staying in the theater for more than an hour. Um, and also, we, we associate a light switch. There was no light switch. You would have to um, to turn the, every single gas outlet um, by 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 going there by proximity. So when the electricity came, it swept the gas out of the buildings very very fast. So the gas era was a very very short time in period, um, and uh, the theaters uh, quickly uh, adapted to the electric lighting with Savoy Theater in London being actually probably the first in the world to, to use electrified um, uh, lighting. Um, so um, uh, the, the intensity of the light meant, that, as we said, that the um, that it was uh, that it was now much more visible. Many more visible details were to the audience, which meant that um, uh, the, the, the scenery was very very unrealistic, and uh, the actors had to to tone down a bit. Uh, and there and there begins a bit discussion because of the lighting between uh, what is an illusionary theater and what is a modern theater. So the illusionary theater tried to create an illusion. Um, 
while uh, the modern theater tried to um, to get away from the fake and the two-dimensional um, scenery and connect the other uh, authors and, and create a narrative rather than imitate uh, the exterior and bring it into the interior. Um, so basically, uh, I have a, I have a very a list here which is quite extensive, but it kind of gives a very brief um, change of the philosophy of theater from the presentational to the representational and the modernism. So the presentational theater, it says by itself, is a center of theater that confronts the audience by acknowledging them through language, movements, and signs. That shows that the actors are aware of the audience presence. The auditorium and the proscenium are one. And there is an interaction. There is not. There is no uh, sense of something happening, and 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 the audience being an observer in the dark. The representational theater is a relationship in which the audience is ignored, um, and they are the viewers. And so basically, the darkened auditorium kind of uh, moves a little bit towards the representational theater. And modernism is where the theater. Uh, breaks the conventions of, of the space, creates a, a new reality, and, and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, um, it's, yeah, we're just gonna a bit, we're gonna talk about modernism a little bit further down, but um, this, this, these changes in the theater happen together with the, the philosophy and the aesthetic movements of the era, so all of those uh, aesthetic movements that are on the on the first part of this side belong to the uh, theater before modernism. So, Commedia dell'arte is the Italian and the Renaissance. There's the English and the Spanish, and then we have Baroque restoration, neoclassical and romanticism. This is before modernism, and everything else down here belongs to modernism. So trying to connect now a little bit the, the things we know today with the things with their history and their position into this continuum. Um, we look a little bit at the uh, advance at the uh, technological advances and when they happened. So Mario Fortuny is uh, is everything. He's a stage designer, he's um, he's a clothes designer, he's an architect, he um, <laughs> Done many things. So uh, he's very famous in lighting about the cyclorama, um, how we call it. He experimented with silk cloth and folded it and constructed it in domes, which he placed it in, in stages and then he lit it in a way that it was so diffused it created the infinity effect. The infinity effect that we, we take for granted now when we see studios that are taking photographs. Or if we want to see a photograph from James Turrell's installation uh, where, where you lose a sense of the edges inside the space. It was very good for creating backgrounds and, um, uh, and depth and making the stage look um, infinite effectively. Uh, some of the other pioneers of the theater that moved the transit to the transition of the modern, I was trying to describe before, uh, we're having a look uh, look at here. So um, we all know Adolf Appiah. Um, he was mainly a theorist that was uh, that illuminated the stage for some of the Wagnerian operas, and he made the breakthrough. He basically said that the two-dimensional uh, state doesn't belong uh, together with three-dimensional people. It doesn't it doesn't create this narrative. It doesn't create the thrill for the theater. They have to be three-dimensional. Uh, objects and, and they have to be connected. So the actor has to be connected with the stage and the lighting has to illustrate that. So we see a shift, a shift in, in what the lighting should be doing as well. It's more of a philosophical shift. Before the, the worry was how can we light a space and make it look like a daylight. The brightest, the better. The more light, the more it's going to look like um, a picturesque scene in a valley. Uh, but then once that was conquered, then the interest started to be drawn into how we create other, other daylight effects. How do we make the moon? How do we make uh, moonlight or sunlight going through a window? How do we create shadows? How do we create um, the shadows at the moment we want them and how do they, they link with the drama and the story? So, so that is the birth of the lighting effects in the theater rather than the more ample light, the better, because it looks like the sun. Um, Edward Gordon Gray is a, also a very famous name. He's a British uh, scenic designer and director and theorist. 
Um, he, he, he's famous for his stage designs and his drawings, but it also, he's also famous for some of the things he wrote about, about, the, the, about the theater. Um, so basically, uh, Erdogan Gordon Gregg, uh, uh, right, so Edward Gordon Gregg, he canceled the footlights, he said the light has to be uh, done from above. Obviously, you can see from his sketches, it was very dramatic lighting. He split the stage into sections um, rather than one unified thing. Uh, he played with the shadows, he, uh, he was using high contrast, um, and he was also, his abstract forms in the stage design coincided with his abstract lighting. So the lighting wasn't trying to create a very specific illuminating effect, but it was more, uh, more like an art, more like a light shaft as it's shown here, um, more like a painting. And Robert Edmund Jones. I think those three people go together because they were in the same era and they modernized theater in their country. So Robert Edmund, Edmund Jones is an American scenic lighting and costume designer which lived at approximately around that period and had similar influences um, for, for me, the most famous thing he's, he said about that is that lighting a scene consists not only in try, throwing light upon objects, but in throwing light upon a subject. So by making that statement, he makes a very clear, he starts building a theory of lighting. So instead of becoming a technical problem, how do we light this and how do we achieve this, this nice light effect that is going to impress people, is trying to to put um, uh, a narrative and a very good justification of why we like that and why we like it in a certain way. What is the mood and what is the story? So the, putting the why behind the light effect is actually substantiating and reinforcing um, uh, the, the lighting designer into having a very concrete uh, end rather than doing something because it it's, looks nice. Um, And then, of course, it's Stanley McCandles, an American lighting designer, um, which is quite famous in America. He's a little bit uh, further chronologically than the other ones. Uh, he's, he's very famous because of uh, his contributions, uh, both written and in the theater and as a teacher. His most famous um, contribution, though, which I, uh, I will uh, stress on here, is basically the uh, McCandles technique which is how to light a three-dimensional object. So he experimented with angles, with positions, how those positions cannot be achieved in the conventional theater, and what, um, what is the best, what is, what is the technique that is, uh, is the best for lighting uh, uh, any 3D object. This technique is purely theatrical. They still use it in film and in theater, the McCandles technique. But it is also subconsciously something that architectural lighting designers use when they have a three-dimensional object in a space. So thinking about the angles um, is, is, is what we think. So um, this is very graphically and very quickly explaining the McCandles technique, which is um, the 45 degree angle. And uh, he's also, uh, remember in the theater, we have, they have to create a realistic uh, view. So, uh, the daylight is always the holy grail, trying to create a variation of daylight with cool light and warm light. So he says basically, whether you agree or not, depends on the style of every lighting designer, that in the uh, early morning hours, the warm should be stronger and the cool should be dimmed down. Well, as the, uh, the story goes towards the late evening, it should be the reverse. Um, so, so yeah, this is the, this is the McCandles technique. So I'm rushing through a bit because I am I'm aware of the time. Um, and then uh, moving a little bit very quickly into the 20th century, Josef Spoboda is a very emblematic figure in the 20th century because also he's done things that other people haven't done before him, which is mainly playing with uh, the Lanterna Magica and uh, bringing other media than the conventional one in, this, in, this, in the States. And you can see that he created compositions in, on the stage with lighting that resemble paintings rather than functional lighting for, for a play. So he's very famous for that as well. And then obviously the uh, heroes of our, um, uh, there's many lighting designers today that uh, have a, uh, many, many tools, um, but uh, uh, the most famous ones that uh, with my limited knowledge are, 
I, I admire is Robert Wilson, um, which has a, which uses such a such a clean. Um, uh, he, ha he has always in his compositions a very clean use of the light effects, and they are segregated in sections, and there's there's no unnecessary blending between the things. They, the, his his stage look his stage designs look like paintings. And that brings to today, which um, I dare say that is tran transdisciplinary. So it's not anymore a lighting designer, but a stage designer goes back into how it was before doing all things together and bringing so many media onto the spectacle, onto the stage, that it's not a very clear border anymore, whether that is lighting or is three dimensional stage design, or it is animation or, um, or dance or music. Um, such as the work by S. Devlin, for example, who doesn't call herself a lighting designer, but I think that lighting plays a very important part to, to her compositions. Um, and uh, the second part of, of, uh, of this presentation is uh, kind of say, is linking, is trying to link uh, the history with what we're doing today. Um, and uh, it's not, it's not going to stay so much on the technical part, which I'm sure you're very well known. Um, but uh, I do believe that all these techniques are coming from theater. So the Gobel Rejector is something that has infiltrated architecture, but effectively comes from, um, from the theatrical lighting. Um, and it's used in architecture, both inside and outside in the exterior space. Our very famous use of lenses. I think most of the experimentations of what a lens can do um, uh, are optics, yes, they're physics, yes, and some of them were produced by engineers such as Gus Fresnel. Uh, but bringing them into creative lighting effects, uh, this actual uh, experimentation happened in theater. So they took those lenses, modified the beams into the black space of theater. And that's how, uh, from a safe kind of uh, point of view, they could see what, what's possible. Another thing that we have in architecture today, very much as good lighting designers that want to do good practice, is obviously we hide our sources. We never leave, leave glare as much as possible. Um, and uh, um, when, when if you go back to architectural lighting, at some point the sources were not so strong, so it wasn't it wasn't so much a consideration. Um, but when the, the light sources became too strong for the eye, the comfort in hiding the source was uh, became started to become very very important. We we don't use the theatrical equipment in architectural lighting because it's extremely bulky and ugly for permanent construction. But we do use the principles, so we do use cows, we do use snoots and honeycomb filters, and if you look back at the very old uh, footlight, the way it is turned away from uh, the auditorium, and it's in the light of the is in the eyes of the actor, and we don't care if the actor gets blinded or not. It kind of creates this um, uh, link uh, between how the light, where the light source should be directed, and how who it should protect from glare and who it should not. Um, also, uh, the use of black color is not an obvious choice when you're designing an interior, um, but it's, um, it's, not, it's, it's very obvious to every one of us that it is the best way to control the light because it absorbs most of it. And that, that basically reduces everything straight and lets you concentrate on what you want. So we see, we see now a lot of, um, of, uh, of, of light sources or almost all sophisticated down lights and all sophisticated light sources have, apart from the deep recess and the, and the apertures and the lenses, they do have the black bezel and they do tend to, um, uh, to, to, to try and absorb as much stray light as possible. But it's not just the, the equipment, we do it in spaces as well. So I picked a few projects from very talented colleagues that have done um, projects um, like that that won many awards. This particular one I think is very relevant because um, um, we see how the black color is used to uh, eliminate every single information about the space and lets us focus on what's happening on in the center, what's happening inside inside the case, what he wants to say. It's a very similar technique we're doing in the theater where you don't care who's next to you. You all want to see one single thing, and that's what's happening on the stage. 
and in museums uh, more classical as well. Other, other, my two colleagues uh, are going to speak in the other lectures more analytically about the dimming and how uh, this has been revolutionary in theatre and how it changed our lives. But I, I put those pictures here for the students at UCL to show the, um, how, where we began from the snuff boy and how we ended up with a super sophisticated dimming because it's, it plays such an important role. And, um, and the theatre uh, is the one that uh, first understood the need and uh, uh, invented and invented and invented up, up to the point where we are now. One of my favorite effects in, in theater is the, um, is the use of the goals, uh, which is illuminated or not illuminated. Um, most of you would know that it can make it you can make the subject disappear when the light is not in on and then they suddenly appear uh, and, and, in, and the, uh, the effect is amazing in the theater. I've been to a few performances where, where this uh, very simple trick never fa fails to amaze. So the use of a ghost or any transparency or translucency who sits at the border between the viewer and the subject um, is a very magical effect um, in a controlled uh, lighting environment. And we see that in architecture, we also see it in art installations. So very, very famous is the Robert Ir Irwin installations of light and space, where he tries to uh, successfully actually manages to dilute the, the borders of space so that it creates an uncertainty of our senses. So with his play of gauzes and the daylight, the spaces look dreamy and they lose the borders. So that's one, one way where um, lighting art is using exactly the same technique. But also in an architectural space, um, in a permanent installation, uh, the translucencies and the separation of spaces and the use of daylight um, creates a very pleasant ambiguity and a semi-privacy. We can see it in offices such as this one below and uh, as uh, in a restaurant, a multi-retail place, that's the one uh, above in, in this picture. And I am going to, I'm going to close this now by um, using those, those uh, images. Emma asked me before about my PhD, I tried to explain it, but um, I, I think I failed. One of the things that I was arguing is that basically the, um, I think that the theatrical space has contributed more to the architectural, uh, sorry, the theatrical lighting has contributed more to architectural lighting than, rather than the other way, because it's free of restrictions. The architectural space is a 360 space. Your users can go anywhere during the lifetime and during the day, and their eyes could be everywhere. Um, so they could be moving 360. You can't put your sources um, wherever you want. It doesn't have that freedom. Also, it doesn't have the freedom of time. Um, even if you do something that uh, over time, this can be very, very tiring. So we're building environments for um, a completely different span of uh, time. While in the theater, this is a show that lasts for two hours and the functionalities, the practicalities of having uh, too much light um, or uh, having too much of a contrast do not become tiring. And this is a freedom. And because of this freedom, uh, it has been an opportunity, it has been an experimental space, um, which I call the black box, the experimental black box of the theater. It's also, if you compare the two, the architectural space is a 360 space, while the theatrical space is a 180, because the auditorium is almost always in the dark. Of course, there, you, you can argue that the theater space is not always a conventional box, that there's many, many forms, and it can be a novel, it can be all sorts of things. But um, you, I think you would be very hard, find it hard to argue that the darkness in the auditorium is the one that makes the show always much more impressive. And so to close, I would say, yeah, that the theatrical space has served as an experimental environment for light effects as it has fewer functionality restrictions than the architectural space. Um, and that's, that's, that's it from me. Um, I hope uh, I wasn't speaking too fast and I, uh, that's, um, it wasn't too much sort of material or too confusing. So I'll um, just gonna stop the share here. And see. I'm, I'm going to say, Alcester, you've done an amazing job. It, it's incredibly difficult to just be talking 
Um, you can't see people's faces like you would do in a, in a normal situation and um, recognize, I mean, myself, I was totally engaged with everything you had to say. Um, uh, and it, it was great, thank you. Um, I'm not from theater, but I know some of the people uh, that are watching us today are. So some of the things are kind of a little bit new. One of the things I could totally recognize with the pollution that must have been in those very early enclosed theaters must have been very, very extreme and, and actually not very nice. And I'm, I kind of almost not a not very nice environment to watch the players. Uh, you know, with soot and everything, and, and the pollution of the candles giving off that must have just those layers of soot and things that must have sat on the interior surfaces must have been quite awful. Well, I was reading, I was reading a few, a few things, and the theater was actually a horrible place to be. <laughs> um, the candles were dripping on you, they were hot and they were burning you. And uh, they were very, very inadequate. So, like, uh, we don't really realize how many candles you need today to, to 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 kind of have exactly the same light levels we enjoy now. And when the gas came, they, they were suffocating spaces. People really were suffocating because the gas was burning the oxygen. And you would enter the auditorium. That some people were saying at 18 degrees, and they would leave at 33, almost fainting. Um, so when gas was replaced with electricity, it was a huge relief. Um, and obviously, gas explosions of theatres were not also so, so rare. So um, also, the theatres are social spaces that are interesting because they are not these refined cultural places we, we enjoy now. They were kind of rowdy at some point, and they weren't considered very um, high class. Um, and uh, because also the auditorium wasn't focused, it wasn't dark, um, and the lights were everywhere, people were doing all sorts of things during the play, and they weren't focused on the poor actors. That, that kind of sounds slightly awful, but so kind of almost going go back to my background, which is interiors, that's why you used to have different covers for the, your soft furnishings. You'd have um, summer covers for your sofas and winter covers because the lighting in, in your interior was by these heavy polluting light sources. Um, so I always find that quite amusing. You have these different sites. So we have moved on uh, massively. I'm very much intrigued by the use of wine as a uh, as a as a fil color filter <laughs> for the players on the stage. I think most people uh, can sympathise with the use of that as a technique, and um, that was great. Um, we haven't had massive amount of questions coming in. Uh, this, uh, we love the idea of the snuff boy, but we, uh, if, if you are, if you, English is your first language, we still say now snuff out the candle. Uh, to, put, oh, yeah. put, to put a candle out, we still say snuff it out. So that's still very much a, a thing. Um, we're very incredibly grateful for you to um, give the lecture today. I'm, I'm, I'm horrified if you were rushed. I loved every second of what you were saying. I am sorry that I was um, talking Is a bit quickly. I was so conscious about having too much material and uh, losing you in the end. So I, just, I, I was absolutely engaged. I think it's just very, very hard when you're not getting that um, feedback from people. I can see as a uh, part of our guest list, we have Anna Sabuku uh, with us today and she's going to be giving the next talk. Anna, do you want to unmute yourself and, and say hello? There, look at her, there yeah. she is. I was not exactly prepared for this uh, show. Ah, sorry! <laughs> <laughs> not sorry! A bit on the dramatic end, uh, just to make a point. Uh, thank you, Augusti, for starters. It was a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, most of the architectural lighting designers are not very familiar, though fascinated, uh, with uh, theatre lighting design and what's the history of it, all the stages that it's gone through and how immensely it has contributed into architectural lighting. And I think that's kind of the, the point of the trilogy of these talks. So thank you very much, Algisti, for the historical background and the basis for um, the talks that are about to come next. No spoiler. Yeah, it was great. And um, I think Kevin and I know the technique you, sh you showed us as a Pepper's ghost. I think that, that's how I know that. Yeah. We, we okay. did some Pepper's ghost in the um, Dubai Museum. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was a you know. sort of automated crossfade. So you had um, a, re uh, a derelict part of the building 
building itself back up again using a Peppa's ghost. I mean, I'm not I'm not an ultra nerd, but I think Princess Leia is actually a Peppa's ghost on Star Wars, but I might be wrong. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let everybody uh, finish off their evenings because we all have other things to do. So thank you so much to our lovely generous sponsors tonight, 3LR, Sean, Kat, Steph, and those guys and the guys at ETC. Thank you so much, Al Steve, for giving us that talk. It's, it's an incredibly valuable amount of material you've shared with us, and I really appreciate that you've done that. Thank you for everybody for joining up. Um, hopefully you'll come to the next one. I need to say that if anyone wants uh, to read any more, there are a few, um, uh, there's a few um, uh, literature that I can share if, you, if you're interested in the subject. Totally. And if there's anything ILD wise or anything you want to know, please contact me. The next one is next Thursday. Um, so hopefully I'll see you all again. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you, Alfie. Thank you.